So welcome back to the podcast, John, for part two. Yes, well, uh, fantastic uh, doing part one. So we've got plenty more to talk about. So thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. If we right, if we go straight into it, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was sort of how you got into the industry, and we could then maybe talk about how others could get into the industry now. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I was always back in the late eighties. I was always making things, and I was making back leads and a few leads and selling them down Pat Sullivan. And I got my mum and my mum to make unhooking mats and that, and selling them down there. So I'd always got this product thing in my head at some stage. Um, and every time I caught a fish, I'd you know I'd try and get it in the magazines and so on and forth. But if you imagine when I started, there were there wasn't even a carp talk. There wasn't he wasn't a carp world. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, there was the Anglers Times, the Anglers Mail, and then when we got carp world, um, that changed lots of things. And then um, you got carp talk as well. Um, and what I did was I just you know got involved with a bait company. Um, they were using my pictures in their promotions. So that got a small bit of awareness out there. And then um, it wasn't until quite a few few years later that um, I was asked by a mate of mine, he says, have you seen this? It's the new um, World Cup Classic in 1998 at Fisherville. And they're looking for marshals. Do you fancy going? You know, yeah. for everything paid for trip, go down to down to France, weigh a few fish, have a few days away. Yeah, okay, I'm up for that. So we got down there, did that for that year, and then um, that's when I, you know, bumped into likes of Rob Hughes, and 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 it was a who's who that year of fishing. Every name imaginable in carp fishing was there, and um, yeah. and the following year I was asked to come back as a like a head marshal of an area. And then from that that point, it was like um, I remember a story. Um, I think it was the ninety nine um, World Cup Classic. It was the um, the presentation at the end, and Rob Hughes had sorted all the uh, marshals out, did all the work, getting everybody sorted, all the fish weighed correctly. And of course, all these competitions they they, they don't exist without marshals, and it's free. Mm-hmm. These guys are doing it for free because they want to be there. So they yeah. up in the middle of the night, up at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, weighing fish for people and photographing for them. And we did all this hard work, and I remember it. Um, and Ross, being Ross, uh, thanked everybody, all the competitors, all the sponsors, everything. And unfortunately, he didn't mention the marshals and hmm. the organisation team behind it, which was a little bit, to us marshals, a little bit, oh, thanks, you know. Mm. We've done this free to help you out. And um, outside, I remember having a little bit of a word with him. And Rob Hughes went, um, thank you very much for say, for sticking up for us. I said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and then Rob said, do you fancy coming to work for me? I'm going to start the British Carp Angling Championships. Mm. So that's how I got in, um, you know, said something at the right time and somebody was listening. Right. Yeah. And from that, we started doing the British Carp Angling Championships. And... Um, 99, yeah, 90, yeah, yeah uh, 1999 British Carp Angling Championships, and it went on from there, and, um, and it's still going nowadays. But that's, that's how I got in, and because of the competitions, I then got to know people um, that own bait firms and tackle yeah. firms, and then you got in with all those. And once you're in, um, as long as you don't, you know, upset anybody, um doors open for you um but nowadays i think it's a lot more difficult nowadays to get in if there's any young kids want to get into the into the carp um you know start working for a company or be a sponsored angler for a company it's a lot harder now because we were only competing back then four magazines so you were in four magazines if you got a regular feature in those magazines as long as you kept doing it you were in there every time so it'll be the same people every month in those magazines slightly rotated around but nowadays a fish capture is posted up on social media probably every minute Mm. probably more than that nowadays so if you think you're going to be um make it by just catching fish alone you're now up against with serious carp anglers there are some amazing carp anglers out there 
that aren't bothered about social media, aren't bothered about telling people mm. what they catch. And, you know, you look through Instagram now, it's cop picture after cop picture after cop picture after cop picture, and it's very difficult to distinguish between what's, you know, normal for one person and what's been, it's been really difficult for others. Mm. Um, if I switch my phone off a second. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. Sorry, mate. And, um, I'm sorry, mate. I don't know if I've switched it off or, uh, Yes, I have. And um, so it's, if you imagine, so what I would suggest for any young young guys out there is more videos. If you can film yourself doing stuff, mm -hmm. uh, as well as catching and doing product reviews, free, if you've bought an item of Tattle, do a product review on it. Send it to that Tattle firm saying, this is a product review I've done. Would you like to share it? Or can you like it on my page? Keep knocking on the door and keep doing. Obviously, you've got to catch. If you can film yourself doing that, if you can film little product reviews and little vlogs, that's the way forward. Because I don't think by if you're putting a photograph of a fish on your Instagram page every couple of days, hmm. it's going to get you massively noticed because you're doing that in a in a you know um, saturated. Saturated, yes, exactly. You know, yeah. there are thousands of people doing the same thing. Hmm. Um, you need to stand out. And people that are filming themselves, doing their own vlogs, or doing little reviews, doing tips, now get that little bit above the rest. So if you can find yeah. a little niche within the industry as well, then that's even better. Mm -hmm. So um, iPhones, 4 4K four, um, iPhones, brilliant. Film yourself, do it. Look at Carl and Alex. Mm. They started quite a few years ago. I saw them when they were young kids, and I thought, these kids are good. They're having a laugh. They're filming themselves. Like, yeah. Nobody bothered about the quality. It was just a couple, yeah. of, couple of keen little lads fishing and filming themselves. Now look what they're doing. Yeah. Brilliant, you know, they're the, probably the highest, highest people on YouTube for, match, for, 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 you know, for angling and what they do, and fair play to them. You know, it's a long road, but they're now they've achieved what they're doing. And yeah. yeah, brilliant, brilliant for them, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, all that effort's starting to um, pay off, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, it's really good too. And there's others. There's um, Otto Reed, Oak Carp. I think he's 16. He's been on the show. Yeah, yeah. Same. He's. Um, and I think the key is to be consistent. Isn't this is it? it. Consistent, consistent little videos, um, yeah. and then you know, on 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 YouTube, you know, if you if you're clever and you you're getting some good views, you monetize your mm -hmm. channel and you make a little bit of money that way. Yeah. You know? There are little ways you can make money out of it. Um it it doesn't happen overnight. No. You know, but like you say, consistency is the key. If you can keep doing it on a regular basis, the more you do, the more you'll get back it as a reward. Yeah, no definitely. On that note about um the British Carp Angler Championships Yep. So, you must have seen some pretty spectacular anglers um, oh, it was such a compete laugh. in those. It was such a laugh down back then, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody, it was, it was criticised at start. You know, mm -hmm. match fishing shouldn't be in carp fishing. You know, um, but Rob just said, "No, let's crack on, let's do it." And and everybody had a go at the start. The first few years, it was a who's who of carp fishing, and yeah. it was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant those days. You know, you said I had such a laugh because it was. It's not like you was. I wasn't fishing. Obviously, I was marshalling and, and that. And you'd walk around and you'd be sitting in a peg with, with, with like um, Danny Fairbrass. The next, yeah. you go around the corner and you're sitting there having a cup of tea with Terry Earn, and you go around mm -hmm. the corner and you're having another cup of tea with Ian Chilcott. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and and, yeah. and that's what it was like. Um. Maybe they all didn't want to do these match matches, but it was the companies they represented to be there. Mm. But they all enjoyed it at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it was good times back then. Very good. We did. Think, I was talking to Rob Toff the other day, and I says, "Do you fancy doing a um, a nineteen ninety nine final reunion on Horseshoe?" Uh, and he was up for that. You know, we had thirty six yeah. pairs on that final. <laughs> So uh, right. that would be a nice little, um, um, yeah. you know, a little get together weekend or 
midweek session on there. Just yeah, relax. Oh, she's bounced back nicely, he hasn't it? Well. Yeah, fair play to him. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. brilliant. Yeah. And it would take that many pairs, wouldn't it? I'd have thought just. Well, even if he's just saying it's just a social, come down and have a laugh. Yeah. Reminisce. Who, um, I'll put you on the spot a bit here, John. Um, who would you say is the top uh, angler that's been in the BCAC? Um, consistency. I mean, looking at the guys that are winning it now, I mean, I've I've mm-hmm. known, I look at like Mark Bartlett and, and um, Tom Maycam, that mm-hmm. style of angler, uh, Wayne Mansford, it's the, it's the never give up um, attitude. You know they're they're constantly at it, and even more so in these you know these later these you know these ones in the past few years. Mm. Um, so that those type of anglers now, but I was looking, I mean, the neck consistency. There was always there was a couple of guys called um, Ian Hunter and, and Pete Holhouse or Pete Holhouse Ian Hunter Ian Hunter that's it Pete Holhouse mm. Ian Hunter did. They were mainline guys. Um, they were very, very consistent. They'd win their eliminator, and then they'd be in the final. And they were always top five. Uh, they narrowly missed out by a recount in, um, mm. I think it was two th- 2000, may have been. Um, but they were very consistent. But overall, with the, the, the weights in the final now, I'd probably say like the likes of Mark Bartlett, Tom Maker, um, Wayne Mansfield, mm. you know, Ryan Need, that type of angler now would take some beating. Yeah, yeah, and it's the um the prep, I suppose, as well, isn't yeah. it? And just being just minimizing any downtime or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. I just they're just they're just very good at what they do. Yeah. You know? So it's uh, yeah, fair play to them. How does the draw take place? In the BCAC. Well, the original draw, I don't know if it's, if it's changed now, the original draw was um, everyone, <clears throat> we do a watercraft draw. So What is that for people that don't know? Yes, uh, a watercraft draw is basically when you turn up at the lake, um, I would normally take people round and show them the pegs and the boundaries of this is where you need to, you can't cast further than that, you can't go past that, you can't, you know, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is your area out of this particular swim. And then what happens is that um, somebody would pull out the first canister, which would be somebody's name. So maybe um, one of the marshals pull out the first canister, but somebody's name, they would come forward, first out the hat, they would choose a peg that they want to go in. Mm -hmm. And then before they leave, they would pull the next person out. So that person would pull out, they would come forward, and they will choose the peg that they want to go in. So unfortunately, the last person that comes out either has a choice of, one peg or two pegs. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, you know, coming out low down um, is a lot easier than coming out first because if you come out first and choose the wrong peg... Yeah, um, pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, big time. Big time. Yeah. Yes. With um, On Watercraft, that will sort of move us on nicely. I, that was a question I was going to ask you, actually. Um Talk to us a bit about watercraft and sort of your findings and learnings over the years, because that's always a really interesting subject. It is, it is. Yes, it's it it does differ from lake to lake, but one particular time um, was when I was on um, Yateley Car Park Lake, and it was it was fantastic back then because after after a few sessions uh, of going down there and climbing trees and watching, you could set your your watch at certain times and you knew the fish were going to arrive in those swims. Um, like one one is, you know, one time you'd be up a tree in Brute's Corner, and at 12 o'clock, I'd make sure I'd go up at about 12 o'clock, and the fish would just drift into that bay. And it was always like Heather would lead the, the pack, <laughs> you know, right. and she would just drift in, and then you'd watch them for a bit, see what they do, and they, they'd just dip down and pick a few bits up and just slowly swim around. There was no rushing involved they were just at their pace and then you'd go around and you knew in half an hour's time they're going to come past this particular spot in this swim and you'd go by and you'd climb a tree and there they were going by and it was about four hours you could do this you think right okay um, in another hour if i go around to that corner go up that tree 
they would come in and sure enough you'd go around in an hour you're up that tree unless somebody else was up there they would drift into that particular spot and it was very clever that some of the guys obviously had worked this out and they were setting traps as the fish were drifting into these spots and that was you know sometimes how they got caught but one particular capture that i'll never forget but, um, my first ever capture of a, a known fish from from the car park was the baby orange i was fishing the snag swim and i got a rod in the snags and um nigel sharp came by and he said have you got a rod in the snags i went yeah it's one just tight under there i said they were in there all all day yesterday he says yeah yeah he says uh, half past eight in the morning the sun will shine into that snag you'll get a take I said, oh, right okay that's confidence for you so obviously mm. sitting there um i'm up early in the morning Waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Wait, where's the sun? Where's the sun? Sun comes around, half past eight, hits the snag, has a take. <laughs> a screaming take, lands it, baby orange. And I remember him saying up to us, he just like nodded his head, winked, and said, there you go. It's like, <laughs> how on earth did he know that? But <laughs> but you can imagine how he knew that is because he knew the lake. He knew certain conditions of the lake. You know, if it was overcast, if it was sunny, if it was windy, he knew the time of when the fish were going to be in certain areas. Yes, if if you if you can work that out on your lake and you know when particular fish are going to be in certain swims at certain times in certain conditions, hmm. you're ninety percent there. Obviously, yeah. the next ten percent is getting your rig and your bait presentation right. Hmm. Um, obviously, it worked out perfect that session, and it worked so. That's yeah. the biggest thing about watercraft is you, you obviously you can't learn things straight away, um, but the 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 only advice I could give people is to just watch, 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 watch. Climb as many trees as you can. If it's a clear lake, watch what the mm -hmm. fish do, how they feed, um, and you'll get a lot closer to what you know the fish that you want to catch. So yeah, that's that's my um, that'll be my little tip. Uh, I've yeah. seen it happen firsthand. You know what I mean. So, yeah, definitely, and that that brings us sort of that ties in with what we said yesterday about uh, just spending as much time as possible there, isn't it? Just learning the like, yes. learning the habits of the fish, like you say, the patrol routes. That's it. That's um, it. Such a massive edge, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be fishing, do you? you? Just have to sort of be there on a walk round. Yes, yes. You can learn a lot from just when you go down to bait up. You know, if your lake's yeah. local and. Or you prepare to travel, you know, a few hours to go and bait up, but you are learning and and baiting up as well. You know, the, the guys that can consistently bait swims prior to mm. fishing are the guys that are consistently catching more fish. Yeah, and it, it's it you know I've I've seen it so many times, and you see these guys, and you think he's catching a few, and then you speak to the bailiff, you see, I'm not surprised he's down every week baiting up. Yeah, and that's Training the fish. That's, yeah, that's a common theme everywhere if you can keep yeah. trickling the bait in and baiting up prior to fishing you will definitely catch more fish yeah, real yeah it's too. difficult on day tickets yeah syndicate chicken club waters you can get away with yeah definitely but they're a bit quieter yeah yeah, yeah and people aren't watching all the time no, no no you couldn't you couldn't go down your day ticket water bait up because the person someone else is dropping that peg aren't they the next day or, yeah you know Absolutely. Which, um, from your sort of history of waters, which one would you say you've put the most effort into with your fishing? Um, the most effort. I mean, traveling wise, there's obviously the longer travel, two and a half hour there and back, mm. a five hour round trip would be like Horton and um, and Yately. But right. But the the most efforts the most time i've spent on one lake was patzel right. um and to be honest with you you know being young you didn't really put too much effort in i mean you did reeling during the day and then spend most of the day surface fishing so you were at mm. it you weren't just sitting behind motionless indicators yeah. you were out trying to find the fish and trying to surface fish for them or a thing that was called um trapping they called it on there where you would walk the, the reed lines or walk into the reeds with a rod with a with a single mixer free line mixer on it which was you know you'd soaked it in you you flavored it so it's quite a spongy one so you could yeah. you could pinch it underwater and it would sink really sink at the speed that you would let it to you know allow it to right. mm -hmm. 
and you would walk in the reeds and you'd you'd all of a sudden you'd come across a fish and you would just flick it out onto a little clear area um, of weed and it would just slowly sink in front of them. Fish would come out, take it, and you'd got one. They called that trapping, um, yeah. stalking, you know, but they call it trapping because you were literally trapping the fish, you know. Um, that So that, that took a lot of effort, you know, standing there for hours trying to get fish to pick up a, a floater or trying to, you know, critically balance a bait dropping down in front of them. So that took a lot of effort, um, but that was also that those times on Patsel was was a laugh as well. You know, teenagers, early twenties, and the stuff you used to get up to. I, I remember, you know, I spoke to you off air about the fireworks and and the yeah. things we used to do. And and this wasn't started by me or, or or our group. It was started by the guys prior to me joining the syndicate, where they were the the week commencing. You know, the firework week. They would have the boards against the meadow with firework rockets being sent across using bank sticks as the launching things, and they were firing rockets across each other. And so that was um, entertaining on um, a couple of weekends of the of bonfire night, and and then we we did something a bit stupid, which I would never recommend to anybody, not even fishing anybody in general. The old boathouse at Patsall we had a small door opening at the rear and about five of us would walk into their bonfire night and we'd all have these little tiny rockets with, with like, you know, 16 inch um, um, wooden um, stems. So we'd break all the stems off and we'd have two each. So we'd all light, we'd light both of them at the same time. So we'd all light them all at the same time. And the only time you could move was when the first rocket started to fly. And obviously without the stick, they spin around and fly everywhere. And you're in a confined space as well, so they were bouncing off the walls. Oh, mate, that was the most funniest thing we have ever done. We would just be rolling with laughter outside. And it was just stupid. You know, you wouldn't think of doing it now. Um, yeah. But it was so funny at the time, that was. You know, we'd finish, have a laugh and go, should we do it again? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, whose idea was it? How did it come about? Oh, mate, I think it was just one of those... Shall we? You know, a couple yeah. of beers. You know, it was uh, it was stupid, but fun at the time. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> but I mean, those those days you would again these things that that you learnt from like Rod yeah. Hutchinson's books, where he would put dubby indicators on and go up the pub. You know, <laughs> and we were doing that. We were we were because you know the bailiff would come come by, and we would put. Um, our rigs, dubby rigs, sorry, not indicate, dubby rigs in the rings with the rod tips under the water. So it looks like our rods uh, our rods were hooked up and not yeah. fishing. And and then, um, but, but they were fishing. You'd switch your alarms off, no indicators on it, and you'd go at the pub and come back. And some of, sometimes somebody would have a fish on the end when they come back, you know. <laughs> um, most of the times you didn't, um, but sometimes you did. And those were, um, obviously, again, I would never, ever do that now. Yeah. But when you're young, you do it. And I would imagine some people have, have done it. Um, but I'm, I don't like going two swims away without really in now anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know. But, yeah, yeah it, it was funny. Yeah, if you're fishing the sort of waters that we typically fish, you don't want them. You know, you want to be on those rods, don't you? Could Definitely. be a fish for a lifetime or Definitely. target fish. Yeah, so I'd Definitely. recommend, you know, stick to the rules. Do not yeah. leave your rods unattended. It's just yeah, a story, definitely. what we did in the past. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, before we knew better. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, some other points that sort of lightly linked to watercraft and sort of have been previous questions on a podcast I wouldn't mind asking. Okay. Um the wind, how that plays um, out in terms of fish location. What's your sort of views on when fish do and don't follow a wind? Uh, personally, I think it's it's temperature. Um, if it's a warm wind, um, the fish. I personally think the fish will be on the end of that warm wind. Mm -hmm. If it's a cold wind, then they're less likely to be. It makes a bit of common sense, really. You know, if you're yeah. standing in the wind and it's uh, summer, but that's got a chill in that wind, 
maybe the fish aren't going to be on that. You know, if it's a nice warm breeze, then, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that, that takes me to um, uh, Fishing Christchurch, Lynch Hill. That uh, yeah. I went there um, when we was doing the British Championships. It was the, each competition was every two weeks. So the weekend right. in between, um, I would have um, three nights fishing. And it was always Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And I would yeah. go there every two weeks. And Petals was about then, a fantastic looking fish. And first, my first ever trip on there, um, it's a clear gravel pit. My first ever fish, it was like my second morning waking up. A guy turned up and he said, um, have you seen anything showing? I said, yeah, there's a few just actually in the next peg, you know, just short. There's a few fish just showing. And he says, all oh, right, I'll, I'll have a look. And he sets up in the next peg, literally under arms, a couple of rods out. And within half an hour, he's had a take. And I've wandered round. And he's, um, and it's, I don't know if, if many people can remember Christchurch or if it still is. It was a bit soft in the edge when you, if you walked yeah. out with your waders. So he was a bit, and, and shallow. So he, I thought, I, I said, mate, I'll go and get my chesties and go out and land it for you. So I've gone out with my chesties, landed the fish, petals. Right. <laughs> so my first ever trip on there, petals had come out. And I told the guy there was a fish just showing in the next peg and he's caught it i was over the moon i was over the moon for the guy and over the moon to see the fish um but that you know remind me next time you know it's watercraft yes share yeah, watercraft you know with people but remember if you're still fishing the fish is showing there move yourself <laughs> do you know yeah. what i mean <laughs> um so that's one one thing to remember but um wind wind wise um yeah, the the temperature I think is the biggest factor when it comes to wind. You know, mm -hmm. I've there's quite a few times that um, you're fishing and the, you think the fish are going to be on the end of the wind and the, the back of it, and I can't tell you why. It's yeah. like you know people are catching on the back of the wind. You think why aren't they down there? You know, in yeah. the wind. Um, it could be pressure, air pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be that the toe on the lake is yeah. stronger that and it, be when it's point. yeah it yeah. could be it could be stronger it could be reversed and it's pushing the food the in the opposite direction um right. when there's a new wind i think they'll move yeah i was going to say when does the wind become stale yes that's right quotes. a new wind they'll move um mm. if it's been blown for a while they back off it you know yeah. do you think that's linked to undertow like when a, possibly. a wind typically goes stale yeah possibly um mm. But only the fish know that, don't they? They 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 yeah. seem to know it before it happens as well for some strange reason. Yeah, that's a funny <laughs> one, that isn't it? Yeah. They're sort of like a few hours ahead of it almost, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. 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 But then then again if you're on a syndicate like like say on Horton and that you could time your watch, you know, time when they yeah. arrive. So, um you know, but yeah, there's there's pressures, there's there's new winds, there's temperatures. But definitely look at temperatures. If that wind yeah. is coming from the north and it's a bit cold, maybe back of the wind, middle of the lake is better. Yeah. You know, if it's a How, southwesterly um, and mild, then in yeah. the edge, right in the edge, in the face of the wind. Nice. How, if you were approaching a brand new water, John, how would you go about it? Um, I'd go for a walk first, go for a walk around, have a look um, prior mm -hmm. to fishing. Uh, find out as much information as I can, um, but but you know that's that's it really. You know, do do all your work and baiting up while you're fishing. Yeah. Um, because it it you're doing two things. You know, you're you're finding finding the features of the lake. You're introducing bait and you're also fishing. So you might as well be fishing while you're learning about the lake because whilst those rods are in the water, there's always a chance. Mm -hmm. so um yeah there's not much prep you know i'm going on the lake because i know there's certain fish in there or it looks nice yeah. you know yeah. i'm not so bothered about i've got to go and catch this big known fish now um yeah. i've i've relaxed that now i've more into um you know the, the people that fish the lake having a good mm -hmm. having a laugh um yeah. no hassle nice surroundings and nice fish 
that's the main thing, mm. you know. But uh, yeah, that that that's it really, you know. Keep the bait going in, um, fish while you're doing it, and just learn as much as you can whilst you're fishing. Yeah. Do you think um, you can find out too much about water, you know, by asking people and sort of get a bit blinkered? Yes, yes. The, I, I fall into that trap before. You turn up on a new syndicate lake and you'll fish your methods from the previous lake the syndicate. So you're, you've, you, you're using your rigs, you're using your bait, you're, you're doing what you did on a previous lake. After a season, all of a sudden, you've morphed into what everybody else is doing. And everyone's fishing it exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then a new yeah. angler will come on, start catching loads. It's because he's not fishing the same as everybody else. Yeah. So don't, like you say, don't be blinkered and don't use what other people are using straight away because everyone in that syndicate might be fishing exactly the same way. Do you know, everyone might yeah. turn up yeah. and say, and after a, after a season or so, everyone starts spamming, baiting up their swim at 12 o'clock and everyone starts bombing at the, at the same time and everyone starts doing the same thing. If you do yeah. something slightly different, it sometimes it upsets the syndicate, but I guarantee you by doing something different, baiting at a different time, using a different rig presentation to everybody else, we'll catch you more fish. Yeah, no, definitely. That's so true. And I think I'm the same. I've probably done it in the past, but sort of fallen foul of that a bit asking too many people and just getting on the sort of air quotes going method. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Just, um, just do your own thing. Just do your own thing. Yeah, definitely. Have you got any, um, little edges you can share that the or stuff that you can share that you don't mind giving away or either with bait or rigs or anything really? Edges. Um, I always sweeten my fruity flavors. And I always mm-hmm. savoury, salty, me fish meal flavours. So I'll right. always add a little bit of salt and a little bit of oil to anything that's a fishy, savoury mm-hmm. bait. And I'll always put a sweetener on my sweet hook baits. Right. Um, because, of course, I want my hook baits to stand out from my feed baits. So that's one thing that I do. Um, mm-hmm. solid bags as, as well, you know, I've seen the results that people have on solid bags are amazing. You know, I, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's a tactic that people are less inclined to use because the fact that you've got to tie the thing up and mm-hmm. if you don't cast it accurately or it doesn't hit the clip or you don't feed it down right, you've got to reel it in, change it for another bag or dry it all out and tie another bag. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you had to, if you had a if you had a competition with a guy that's fishing a solid bag or a guy that's fishing a Ronnie, the guy with a solid bag will catch more fish. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's not the fact that he's, the Ronnie's got a single up bait; they can both spot. But I guarantee the guys that fish the solid bags will catch more fish than the guys that fish the Ronnies. So if you think next time you're out that. You look at Mark Bartlett and Tom Maker and all that, and, and Wayne Mansfield, like we talked about before, British Championships. Yeah. Solid bags. Constantly fishing solid bags. And look at the results that those guys have. Mm. Right, That's one product, that's one method that you don't see enough of, even though it's a devastating tactic. Yeah, again, you think that's down to the effort required. Yeah, there's more effort. It's more time-consuming. It's not as trendy and fashionable as the Ronnie, but boy, does it catch you more fish. So that any tip when it comes to, to fishing, next time we're out, when, when we're allowed out, if Boris lets us out tonight, <laughs> or lets us out at the beginning of June, tie yeah. up a load of solid bags, get your rigs perfect, get just, you know, get your hook baits right, tie, tie up 20 solid bags, leave them in your bucket, in the pellets, they're yeah. ready to go. Time on, mm-hmm. guarantee they'll work every time. Yeah, brilliant. Um, do you have any issues if, like pre tying solid bags? Do you have any issues with uh, hook baits drying out? Or would you just fish a plastic hook bait? Um, from, uh, I don't really affecting the buoyancy. I don't. I don't tie them and leave them for months. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I'm I'm quite happy with that anyway because if I'm fishing a little bottom bait, then you know that if it's a bottom bait within 
within the you know little um a barrel within the bag yeah then it's not it's not changing any you know buoyancy or anything of the whole plate anyway so mm-hmm. you know it's not a problem of course if you want to tip it with a bit of plastic then then that's fine you know so then but no i don't have any problems with that yeah, but nice. but then i don't i don't actually tie them for months and have a month yeah. supply you know it's it'll be i'll have five or six ready for a session if five if yeah. if all five of them work i've done brilliantly yeah do you know on the on the lakes that i fish yeah. Yeah. and very rarely yeah. they all work in that one yeah. session but but that's how many times i would use it and it's um you know it's just a brilliant way of fishing yeah and it's the confidence levels as well because you're pretty much fishing aren't you wherever yes you, you need, yes. You you've never got that niggle no even in the, in the weed your mind you know you can yeah. drop a bag in the weed it still gives you confidence that you'll get a pickup mm-hmm. do you fish them in the edge much uh, not so much in the edge, no. Little tiger nuts and little broken bits in the edge. Mm. Um, I've watched fish. I mean, I watched a fish last season. This was silly. That, that I was fishing and and the, the fishery owner come over. He says, oh, there's a few fish in the corner. Come and have a look. And this little platform. We mm. went out there and he says, bring a rod. I says, I've only got, I've only got, a, I was fishing Ronnie's. Um, mm. I've only got Ronnie's. He says, oh, that'll do. We dropped this Ronnie in the edge, right? And we're watching these fish. And he dropped dropped in. This fish came in, and it was one of the big 40-pounders. He Mm. came in, and he, like, mouthed the bait and then just turned away quickly, gone. (laughs) And that was a Ronnie in the edge, right? This Ronnie works, caught it everywhere. Mm. Caught, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we laughed. We thought, flipping egg. And, And ever since that fish bolted, not one fish would come into that area where we've put some bait. There was no lines in there. They just would not go into that area where we baited. Now, we, we sat there watching for ages. Prior to putting the rig in, they were feeding on the spot. We put the rig in. A fish spooked on the rig. We pulled the rig out, and the fish still wouldn't return to that spot. Now, I don't know if they give off some kind of pheromone, whatever, or signal in the water saying, this area is danger. But yeah. there was no rigs in there. And they still wouldn't feed on the spot. But a week to that day, I caught the same fish from a spot further out with the same rig. <laughs> Strange, <laughs> so instead of four foot of water, I caught it in eight, yeah. foot of, four, eight foot of water with the same rig. And it's 42 pounds. God. Madness. That's really weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you explain that? Not... No. I honestly can't. It it did yeah. me the week before in shallow yeah. water, but then in deeper water, I caught it. <laughs> now, I, pff, I'm sure somebody could explain that, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, is, I is think it the light penetration, yeah. he could see more. Uh, did he approach it from a different angle in the eight foot? Do you know what I mean? Um, but I don't know, but I was well happy to land it. Is that the beauty of, of fishing in general, do you think, that sort of mysterious side to it where we never never fully know what's happening? No. You you'll never know what's happening and, and it is it is the look of the draw. When you mm-hmm. sling those rods out, you don't know which fish is gonna pick it up. Yeah. I haven't got a clue. And um, we don't know how many times that rig's been picked up and mm. spat out. Yeah. You know, the hooks being sharpened and people, you know, uh, the hooks out the packet are sharp now. But I'm convinced, you know, if you've got, if you spotted out three or four or five kilo of bait mm. and the fish is showing on it and you haven't had a take, they're doing you. Yeah. They're picking the rigs up and spitting them out. Now, if anything to go by, if I, you know, if you go back to what I just said about that fish picking up that rig and spitting it out and then not coming back to that spot again. Do you know what I mean? It's like, is that is that happening out there as well? But there's yeah. no way, there's no way of knowing. But I'm sure they do you every time, every every session. You know, I think you've had a pickup and they've spat you out. Mm. It's just the look of the draw. If they turn the head in the right direction, or the hook works perfectly, but I don't think every rig works 100 percent every time. 
Yeah, no, there was. I can't remember which guest it was. They mentioned on Christchurch. Well, I think it might have been Ian Paul actually. Yeah. Um, where he said one guy had fish all over him, didn't get a take, and he wound in in the morning, and all three rigs were all just like they'd been for a mangler. They were just all twisted, and obviously yeah. the fish had yeah, yeah. managed to get away with it on all three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> disheartening. But that 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 happens all the time. You know, when you watch yeah. the match anglers and they 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 miss bites. Mm. You know, and if float goes under, that's a bite. They'll lift the pole. There's nothing there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and they're getting bites all the time. I know it's different because there's more fish, but mm. we are getting pickups every single time. That that rig, that hook part is being lifted up. That lead isn't moving because the only way we're going to get indication is when that lead moves. And if you've got yeah. semi, if you've got mega slack lines, you know you can pick that lead up and move it all over the place and you're not going to get an indicator indication at your buzzer end yeah you now the, the easiest thing for people to do if you wanted to experiment this if, if you go on a field with with a rod put a rod on your buzzer and mm. walk out go on a football field walk out 50 yards put a lead on the yeah. floor right yeah. and then then say right okay i'm gonna have a tight line to the lead and then move the lead if you go right mm. and right and left with your lead you, st- you don't get an indication if you yeah. go towards your rod, you get a drop back. If you go away from mm. your rod, you get a forward, you know, t- a bleep. Yeah. If you do, then if you do mega, mega slack, so it's lying on the floor, which it seems to be the trend, you can pick that lead up and walk around in big circles. You're not getting any indication from that end until the yeah. fish moves sufficiently enough to tighten the line for it to in- show an indicator. Mm-hmm. So, but we found that we did a semi slack was enough for you to pick the pick the lead up. Whichever way you moved, you got a bleep. Yeah. But the further you're out fishing, the further it's exaggerated. Right. Okay. You know, and people can try this themselves. You know, they can go out on a football field with a rod and try it, and you'll see, and then you'll work out how tight you've got to get your line to get maximum indication but you can still move the fish can still move that lead about mm-hmm. without getting indication so yeah, they're doing it i'm convinced they're doing this all the time they're probably yeah, doing definitely. me all the time all the time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. do you um favor braid or mono uh mono yeah yeah mono all the time um why is that i don't know i think again i, I do have these these questions if you look at again look at match anglers they fish downwards from a float and the fish are still picking up the bait at the bottom right at the bottom of their line that line goes vertically down that bait is just touching the bottom so everything is down and they still pick up that bait on that hook that's vertically down if we could mm. all fish vertically down i think it would help but then yeah. There's one one thing I, I've mentioned to people before. You're walking through a woodland, and you you walk into a cobweb. The first thing you do is like, oh, and you try and move it away from your face, don't you? Because yeah. you didn't see the cobweb. It's hit you in mm-hmm. the face, so you've you've reacted to it. You imagine if that cobweb was bright orange and you could see it, you'd duck under it yeah, and carry on. So maybe using braid, where it's visible, could be an advantage in certain places than an invisible line going into your to your baited area. Right. Because if the fish can see it, they're less likely to spook on it. Mm-hmm. If they can't see it and, and touch it, they spook. Yeah. So you, the last thing you want is frightened fish in your peg. You know, you don't want spooked fish, do you? You want fish that are relaxed and happy. Yeah. They're more likely to stay longer and then you're going to get a bite. So... Um, it could be fluorocarbon, mono, or braid has mm-hmm. its uses at certain times. Um, but it's having the, the oh, I'm going to use braid and see what happens, <laughs> you yeah. know, it, on a, on a real, on a water where there's lots of fish and you're catching lots all the time. Maybe you could test these out and see if it makes mm-hmm. any difference. But, um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I do look at that if it's a clear water, um, you know, it may be fish something that's visible, so the fish don't spook on it. Just a thought. Yeah. Somebody might get an idea out of it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Like that. 
One question I want to ask, um, because you've been in the industry for a while, what winds you up the most these days in angling? Um, I don't know. What winds me up in angling? You're quite laid back. Yeah, I mean... I think there's, you know, the jealousy of people catching fish could be a little bit annoying. It's mm. only a fish at the end of the day, you know. It proves the fish being caught, um, it, and it's, you know, that person might have it next anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's, mm. I don't think, you know, there, there isn't enough, you know, I don't know why people can get jealous over captures. Um, you know, if everyone was happy for everyone catching fish, that's it. But that it doesn't really wind me up. Hmm. Um, but uh, so, mate, I think if everyone was happy and positive in fishing, I think that everyone would get on a lot better. Yeah, I would imagine I agree. being a little bit fish at all costs and and jumping in a peg and reserving mm-hmm. a peg for somebody else that can be a bit annoying. Yeah. Um, because that's like, you know, it's not fair on the other anglers that are, are there that you're reserving for somebody else, but yeah, you know, it's, um, there isn't much really. I think if everybody congratulated everybody on their fishing, then it'd be a lot better, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, one other point I has just popped into my head, um, what about moon phases? Are you a believer in that? Do you read into that? I've looked much? at it. I haven't really set my fishing on on the moon phase because you know you have to set your fishing on the time when you can go. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the weekend anglers. Are, you know if they can only do Friday to Sunday, one one you know once a once a year they'll drop on a full moon. Um, yeah. Some people believe it happens. It works. Some people, it's not. I mean my. I think my full moon, that Billy capture I caught, I talked about it, um, previously was, was a full moon, yeah. but that was a mirror and people say that commons come out on a full moon. So right. I've never really looked at it, but I, I, I know a lot of people swear by it, mm-hmm. but yeah. so maybe, okay. maybe it's something I need to have a look this year once we're allowed to go out and just, just try it, just make the effort to go out on a full moon and see if it makes any difference. Yeah, it's an interesting one, and again, it's one of those things that can never, I suppose, really be proven, no, can it? No, but then again, it's like we were saying about watercraft and that, it's like, right, okay, there's a warm breeze or a cool breeze, do I go down, follow the wind, but it's a full moon, Is they, are they going to move on a full moon, are they going to, is it high pressure, are they, do you think a zig would be better? So you've still got to get all the other factors correct as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's all Absolutely. about ticking the boxes, isn't it? Sometimes you tick the boxes without knowing, and some other times you've you've missed a few and you don't catch. Yeah, no, that's a real valid point, and I think it was Terry Helm, wasn't it, that mentioned it originally about just stacking those little half a percent Absolutely. here and there yeah. in your favour. Yeah. yeah, he knows how to do it. Yeah, real valid point. Um, are there are there any questions or points that I should have asked you that I've missed, or anything you'd like to cover, mate? Uh. No, mate. I think we've. Uh, I think we've. I've, I can waffle on for ages, as you can, as you can see. <laughs> but no, I think we've covered quite a lot, there, haven't we? Yeah, that's no, good, it's mate. Been it's been a good couple of episodes. I've enjoyed it. Yes, yeah, been good, mate. It's been good. Thanks for having me. That's all right. So, uh, okay, we'll wrap up there, then, John. And um, same again. Send me another picture, and I'll do the post today, and we'll get it all live. That'd be brilliant. Cool. No worries. You need, you need another sketch. No, no, that one's fine. <laughs> All right. I would like to see the video of the timings, just uh, as the uh, yeah. It was like I, I, um, I stroke pulled. I used two pencils at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it doesn't say you can't. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Well, okay, okay I'll, I'll ping over another image. Catch yeah, on. great. Excellent. Brilliant. Thanks, Dom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.